Hallo, so schön, dass du da bist, hier beim Podcast Happy, Holy and Confident, deinem Podcast fürs Herz und den Verstand. Mein Name ist Laura Marlina Seiler, ich bin unter anderem spiritueller Coach, ich bin Autorin, ich bin Podcasterin, ich bin Gründerin der Rise Up in Shine Uni und meine große Vision ist es in meinem Leben, so viele Menschen wie möglich für ihren eigenen spirituellen Weg zu begeistern und dir die Tools und das Wissen an die Hand zu geben, wie du wirklich ja, dich selbst entdecken kannst, in deine innere Fülle eintauchen kannst und dir ein Leben erschaffst, das du liebst. Dafür bin ich hier, dafür gehe ich los und ich freue mich, dass du da bist. Ich freue mich unendlich, denn heute ist tatsächlich für mich ein ganz besonderer Tag, da dieses Interview dass du gleich hören wirst, das Interview ist, von dem ich seit, ich kann es dir gar nicht genau sagen, ich glaube, seit über fünf Jahren habe ich mir gewünscht, Tiririai Trent bei mir im Podcast zu haben, weil sie eine der Frauen ist, die mich so wahnsinnig auf meinem Weg inspiriert haben. Und ich habe einen vor, es muss so vor fünf Jahren gewesen sein, habe ich ihr Interview mit Oprah gesehen. Und ich war so hin und weg von, der, von dieser Frau von dem, was sie in ihrem Leben erschaffen hat und von der Weisheit, von der Güte, von der Stärke. Und deswegen freue ich mich wirklich so sehr, dass ich sie jetzt interviewen konnte, dass sie in meinen Podcast gekommen ist und dass ich dieses Gespräch mit dir teilen kann, weil ich weiß, dass dieses Gespräch dein Leben wahrscheinlich genauso verändern kann, wie es meins vor fünf Jahren verändert hat. Und Tirirai Trend, ich will gar nicht zu viel wegnehmen, ehrlich gesagt, von ihrer Geschichte, weil sie ihre Geschichte in dem Gespräch selber erzählen wird. Ich sage einfach mal so viel, Tirirai Trend ist in Simbabwe geboren, ähm, wurde mit elf Jahren verheiratet, mit 18 Jahren hatte sie bereits vier Kinder, es wurde ihr verboten, in die Schule zu gehen und wenn wir jetzt einen kleinen Zeitsprung machen, heute hat sie in Simbabwe ihre eigenen Schulen gegründet. Sie hat in Amerika ein PhD gemacht, das heißt sie hat einen Bachelor, ihren Master und ihren PhD in Amerika gemacht. Sie ist Professorin, sie ist Erfolgsautorin und ja, also nach dieser Geschichte habe ich mir geschworen, dass es wirklich nichts gibt, was man nicht erreichen kann. Deswegen hör dir dieses Gespräch an. Wir sprechen darüber, wie wir beginnen können, an die eigenen Träume zu glauben, auch wenn sie wirklich absolut unmöglich erscheinen. Absolut unmöglich. Stell dir ein junges Mädchen von 18 Jahren vor, die nicht in die Schule gehen durfte, die bereits vier Kinder hat, die zwangsverheiratet worden ist, die den Traum hat, in Amerika zu studieren wo jeder sagen würde, es ist nicht möglich, sie hat es geschafft. Deswegen, wir sprechen darüber, wie du beginnen kannst, an deine Träume zu glauben, auch wenn sie unmöglich erscheinen. Was der entscheidende Schlüssel ist, um deine Träume tatsächlich zu manifestieren. Wie du in Herausforderungen oder auch in der Not das Geschenk darin erkennen kannst, dass du in diesem Moment bist. Und wie so Gemeinschaft und gegenseitige Unterstützung so wichtig für das eigene Glück sind. Und ich hoffe wirklich aus tiefstem Herzen, dass sich dieses Gespräch genauso inspiriert wie mich. Ich war danach, ja, bis jetzt begleiten mich die Worte von ihr in, in meinem Kopf und in meinem Herzen. Und ich hoffe, dass es bei dir genauso wird. Das Interview ist auf Englisch. Wie immer findest du bei mir auf dem Blog und auf YouTube im Video in den Untertiteln die deutsche Übersetzung, wenn du gerne einfach mitlesen möchtest. Ansonsten, genau, hörst du einfach zu und ich freue mich natürlich wie immer, wenn du danach bei Instagram vorbeischaust, at Laura Marlina Seiler, mir da folgst und mir unter dem Post von dieser Podcast-Folge schreibst, was waren deine Gedanken, was hast du für dich mitgenommen, was war deine Erkenntnis und folge natürlich auch super gerne Terry Reitrend, ähm, unterstützt ihre Foundation und äh, ja, lass uns doch als Community ganz, ganz viel Liebe, ganz viel Kraft, ganz viel ähm, Support an, an die Foundation von Tirai Trend schicken, weil sie wirklich ein, eine unglaubliche Veränderung da bewirkt bei jungen Frauen. Viel, viel Freude mit diesem Interview. Danke, dass es dich gibt und viel Spaß. Deine Laura. I am so deeply grateful and excited to have you on the show today because you are one of the guests that I want to have on the show, I think, since five years. <laughs> and now is the day. So welcome on the podcast. So nice to have you on. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So 
the reason why uh, why I wanted to have you on on the podcast is that once I I read about your story and I was so touched and moved and inspired and it just for me um, you have this word uh, tinongo I don't know if I pronounce it correctly no tinogona tinogona which tinogona. means yes yes tinogona yeah. and uh, maybe we can start with that. So how does that word maybe stand for your journey and what, what does it mean to you? You know, Tinogona, it's, it's a mantra for me. Um, it, despite the challenges, we always have to think about, do we believe in ourselves to achieve our dreams? And Tinogona, it is achievable. And it's, you know, I was reminded of this word by a woman who came to my rural village. So I come from, or I was born in a country that was known as Rhodesia. And now it's Zimbabwe. So I was born during a colonial um, government and, um, and so many girls did not have the opportunity to go to school. And mostly because the colonial system denied many people their right to education. And when you mix that with the patriarchal system, you'd find many women are locked into this system that never see women and girls they never see their values. So I didn't have much of an education, neither did my mother or her mother. I always talk about, I come from this long line of generations of women, women who had been denied their right to education, women who had been denied their dignity. So here I was, 18 years of age, and I was already a mother to four kids at 18, and I did not have any high school education at that moment. And I knew I was following this same pathway that my great-grandmother and my grandmother and my mother had followed. But I knew I needed an education because when I looked at my grandmother, she was this wise woman. Many would come to ask her to deliver babies. Without the ability to read and write, she would rise and deliver babies in the community and far. And I would always think if my grandmother he had had an opportunity for an, for an education. Maybe she would have become one of the best gynecologists in the whole world. Mm -hmm. So I knew I needed an education. Because when I talk about this story of my grandmother and my great-grandmother and my mother, I would always visualize them as though they were born into this race the rest of poverty. And as they are born into this rest that they never defined, they are carrying this baton. You know, when runners are running and handing over a baton. So my great grandmother is running with this baton of poverty. She runs so fast with this baton and the baton carries illiteracy. It carries lack of education. It carries oppression. It carries having too many babies, abuse. She runs with this baton that carries all this ugliness. She hands it over to my grandmother. My grandmother grabs that baton, this baton of oppression, the baton of women who are silenced. She runs with that baton and she hands it over to my mother. My mother grabs that baton, this baton and she runs and she hands it over to me. So I would always think that I was running, running a race that I never defined and I needed to change my life. So when we gained independence, all of a sudden, Americans, Australians, Germans would come to our villages 
and mostly they were women. There was something about these women that really made me want to achieve my dreams. The way they walked, the way they talked, like your awakened woman, your powerful woman, the way they would look at their notes, even, you know, picking things from their bags. There was something about it, which I would look around me in my village and, and I don't see women with that kind of demeanor. And I knew I can be just like these women. So one woman came to my village and her name is Jolak. And she asked me one question that no one had asked me before. What are your dreams? And I am looking at this woman. She's an American and I'm thinking she must be crazy. Me, black woman, marginalized, oppressed. Am I supposed even to have a dream? She saw the hesitation. She said, please tell me what are your dreams? When I opened my mouth, I became a chatterbox. And I said, I want to go to America. I want to have an undergraduate degree. I want to have a master's and I want to have a PhD. There was silence, silence. Because the other women who were there from my village, I could see their talking eyes that they were saying, how can you even dream of going to America, even to dream of having an undergraduate? You don't even have a high school diploma. In that moment, I felt my vulnerability. Why would I share these crazy dreams with a stranger? And the woman opened her mouth and she said, if you truly believe in your dreams, they are achievable. And she used the word Tinogona. Ha! And I'm thinking, I can do this. And I always tell women, sometimes when we are silenced, sometimes when we feel marginalized, we need other women who can look right into our eyes and say, yes, you can do it. That's all sometimes, that's all we need. An encouragement, a mentor, words matters. So, I ran to my mother and I said, mother, I met somebody who inspired me, who made me believe in my dreams. My mother said, Tererai, if you truly believe in what this stranger has said to you and you work hard, and let's say you achieve your dreams, not only are you defining who you are as a woman, but you are defining every life that comes out of your womb in generations to come. And I knew in that moment that my mother was handing me an inheritance. It was through her wisdom. And she said, now, just the way we bury the umbilical cord, the birth cord of a child, when a child is born, the female elders of the village, they surround this infant and they snip out the birth cord, the umbilical cord. They tie that umbilical cord in an old cloth and they bury the umbilical cord with the belief that when this child grows, wherever they go, whatever happens in their life, the umbilical cord will always remind them of their birthplace. My mother said, write down your dreams and bury them. The word bury and plant is the same in my culture. We plant seeds and we bury the seed from termites and from insects. You write those dreams, you plant them deep down under the ground and bury them. Despite the abuse in your life, 
despite the ugliness, the silencing in your life. Those buried dreams will always remind you of their importance. So I wrote down four dreams to go to America, to have an undergraduate, to have a master's and a PhD. And I was ready to bury those dreams. And my mother said, Terrorai, I only see that you have four dreams and they are personal dreams. But let me tell you one thing, your dreams in this life will have greater meaning when they are tied to the betterment of your community. I had no idea what my mother was saying. I was ready to bury my dreams so I could see them grow. She repeated the same thing. Your dreams in this life will have greater meaning when they are tied to the greater good. So I ended up writing my number five dream. When I'm done, I want to come back and improve the lives of women and girls in my community. So this, these little girls, they don't have to go through what I had gone through. Because I had been exchanged for a cow as part of the marriage. My great grandmother was exchanged for a cow. My mother, my grandmother was exchanged for a cow. My mother was exchanged for a cow. And I knew that was the silencing of women. So I buried my dreams. It would take me eight years, eight years to achieve my high school diploma. I was poor. I didn't have any money. I would do correspondence. That time we were still under the British system. So I would take, I needed five subjects to achieve a high school diploma. So I would take two classes at a time because we didn't have any money. And my mother would sell vegetables for me to pay for my tuition. After those eight years, in fact, during those eight years, my grandmother would say, Terrorai, you need to go to this place where you buried your dreams and visualize as though we are already living those dreams. So I would go and spend hours at this place where I had buried my dreams. I had never been in an aeroplane in my life. The only aeroplane that I knew were the war helicopters because I grew up during the war. So these helicopters would fly and I would visualize myself getting into that helicopter as an aeroplane. And this helicopter would take me to this place called America. And I would visualize myself arriving in America, see myself carrying books and getting into a classroom. And I would visualize all those dreams. I had nothing except to visualize the life that I wanted. So when I received the letter from Oklahoma State University to say I had been accepted to pursue an undergraduate in agriculture, I could not believe it. When I went to that airport, Harare International Airport, to get into that flight, finding myself sitting in that aeroplane, there was this feeling, this deja vu feeling like I've been here before because I had dreamt it, I had visualized it. So I arrived in America and pursued my undergraduate degree. It was tough, it wasn't easy because later on I brought my kids. I didn't have any scholarship. I used to work three, four jobs 
for me to pay tuitions and put food on the table. I remember one day my kids were brushing their teeth. I think they had arrived in America three months and I could see their gums were bleeding. And I knew my kids were missing fruits and vegetables. Because I used to work in these restaurants on campus when customers leave their French fries and burgers and I would bag everything into a bag and bring the leftovers to my kids to eat. Back home, we relied mostly on fruits and vegetables. So I knew my kids were suffering and I almost gave up. And I said to the university, I think I'm done. It's one thing for me to pursue my dreams, but it's another to see my own babies suffering. The university said, well, Tererai, they are local stores. Sometimes they throw away fruits and vegetables that are going bad. Some of them are not that bad. I hope you don't mind if we can introduce you to the local store so they can help you. And I said, sure, please. I needed those fruits and vegetables so badly. I was tired of feeding my kids French fries and hamburgers. And they were not even fresh French, French <laughs> fries, leftovers from customers. We went to the store and the store manager said, no, we can't do that. In this, in this country, if you eat from these bad fruits and vegetables, and if anything happens to you, you might end up suing us. And I looked at this store manager and I said, I have no dime, I have no penny to sue anyone. Please, just please give me those fruits and vegetables. And I remember the store manager, he was emotional because I was also emotional. And the guy said, please wait. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to give you the fruits and vegetables. I'm going to put those fruits and vegetables in a cardboard box and I'll put the cardboard box outside near the trash can. You make sure that four o'clock PM, 4 PM, you are here to pick your cardboard box. Don't be late. Well, three, four jobs, Sometimes I would be taking 14 hours of coursework. I was always late to that cardboard box. And I would find the cardboard box already into the trash can. Some of the fruits and vegetables have already spilled into the trash can. I would pick that cardboard box, gather all the fruits and vegetables wash them and feed my kids. And I would ask myself, who am I even to complain that I am feeding my kids from a dirty trash can? When I know there are thousands, if not millions of children out of Sub-Saharan Africa who are homeless, street kids, who are eating from dirty trash can, at least in the American trash can, somebody washes it. I used to live in a trailer house and sometimes when it rains, I find myself in a corner with the kids and I'm asking myself, who am I even to complain that I live in a dilapidated trailer house with my kids? When it rains, I find myself in a corner with the kids. Who am I even to complain when I know in this Western world, I've seen homeless women who have no shelter. At least I have some place. At least I can see at the end of the tunnel, there is light. I can see I'm going to achieve my dreams because I'm doing my undergraduate degree. So I 
finished my undergraduate, went on to do my master's in plant pathology, which is the same field as agriculture. Graduated, before I could go for my PhD, I thought this is just too much. I can't do this. I can't do this. I need to find a job. So I applied for a job and got accepted at this place. It's a little town. It's a city called Little Rock, Arkansas. And the organization that I had applied, the name is Hefa International. So I started working for Hefa International. And one day this woman, she looked at me, she said, you look familiar. And I am thinking to myself, well, I've met many women, I don't know. I said, really, you look familiar. I know you. And, and I'm thinking, how do I respond to that? And she said, you must be from Zimbabwe. Oh, at that moment, I looked at the woman and I realized that was the very same woman who had inspired me to believe in my dreams. The same woman who had said, Tinogona, it is achievable. And her name is Jolak and now, she is the CEO and president of Hefa International. And I had met her some 14 years back. Wow. And I am thinking, what are the odds? Yes. Wow. When the universe believes in us, when God believes in us, Miracles happen. And I, I remember my first trip back home because she said, Terry, I know your dreams. You still have to do your PhD. So my first trip back home, I went to that place where I had buried my dreams. And I checked going to America, checked undergraduate, checked master's, and I reburied my dreams because I knew there were two dreams that I needed to achieve, my PhD and giving back. I came back to the US, enrolled myself at Western Michigan University where I ended up graduating with my PhD in interdisciplinary evaluations, which is a lot of statistics and measurement for an old woman like me. In wow. every class that I took, I was always the oldest student and sometimes older than the professor himself or herself. But I didn't care because I knew I was on a journey. I knew I needed to reshift this baton and never to pass it on to my kids. So I, I remember walking that stage to receive my PhD. And I was thinking to myself, here is my closing argument. If we give education opportunities to those who are torn down and marginalized, they can achieve their dreams. If we believe in the dreams of women, if we believe in their silencing that they can be awakened, women can change this world through education. And now I am so happy for the moment. But when I went back home, it hit me. 
how on earth was I going to achieve that number five dream to give back to my community? Dear mother, why did you make me write that dream? Why can't I just be happy with this American dream that I have? You know, I have a PhD. I can work anyway. I couldn't find any joy. And one day, I decided I was going to design some T-shirts and have that word Tinogona, it is achievable as part of the design. And I said to myself, I'm going to sell these T-shirts, thousands and thousands of these T-shirts and raise enough money and go back home and build a school in my village so that the kids, they don't have to suffer. So the girls can also have an opportunity. I'm going to create an empowerment platform, an economic empowerment platform for women so they don't have to rely on someone else's income. Wow. I only sold 20 t-shirts and mostly they were purchased by my American friends. I was devastated. I, I wanted to go back home and make a difference. Dear mother, why did I write that dream? Then I got a phone call, the most memorable call of my life, the call from Oprah Winfrey. She ended up donating $1.5 million for me to rebuild a school in my village. And that reminded me that my mother was very smart. My grandmother was very smart. They knew that our success is tied to the greater good. It's not about our personal goals in this life. It's not about the degrees and the diplomas. It's not about our personal financial goals but it is about how we connect those financial goals to the greater good, how we connect the education, our personal education to the greater good. That's what makes us successful. So today in partnership with Oprah Winfrey, not only did I manage to build that school, to rebuild that school, but we, through my foundation, we have expanded to be rebuilding and supporting 12 schools in wow. Rosenberg. We have the very first school, when we started, it had, it had hardly girls and many kids, but today it has become one of the largest schools in the district, 1,900 kids attending the school. And uh, wow. about 40,000 kids have gone through our education system. No child from our schools had attended university. And today we have girls sitting in large numbers attending universities. That's the power of believing in education. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I think this story is, I think every person around the world needs to know your story. It's so amazing in, in every sense. It's not just that you, how you transformed your life and what you changed in your life without anyone helping you just out of your own force and power and belief and how just you transformed the life of thousands of, of children of Zimbabwe, which is just, it's amazing. It's really amazing and, and inspiring. Thank you so much for sharing. But I shouldn't take the credit uh, because, you know, I stand on the shoulders of many, many people. 
I stand on the shoulders of giants. I couldn't have done it without others. But you were I, the one that believed. And I think this is special because I, I know or I can imagine how hard it is to believe when everything for generations, everyone killed the belief of, of, of your ancestors, how hard it is to even allow yourself to have the spark of, of vision. So I think this is something very special. And I'm so grateful that you, that you buried your dreams and that, that you um, pursued your dreams so that others can follow. This is amazing. So thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. And um, you wrote a book, The Awakened Woman. Can you maybe mm -hmm. tell a little bit about the book and maybe also um, for women who are, no matter where they are in the world, but who got in some way um, discriminated or who, who got taken away their power, how can we start again to, to believe in ourselves? Because you said it's the women who are going to change the world. I, I believe in this very, very much. So how can, how can women start to believe in themselves again and follow their dreams? You know, I always say um, those women who have an opportunity, like I have, I, I am privileged. Those women who are privileged, I think we need to be the fatal ground mm -hmm for other women to rise and thrive. I don't believe in building silos, neither do I believe that one individual person has the power to achieve things on their own, no. Every one person that you see rising and becoming successful, there's someone behind them who made it happen. Mm -hmm. There's someone's shoulder where they stood upon. So when I wrote this book, The Awakened Woman, anyway, it's, it can, it, it, it's, it, you can see it. The Awakened Woman. I realized that there are many women who are silenced. And I always say, the silencing of one woman, the silencing of two women, it is our collective silencing. It is our collective wound. We have a moral obligation when we see other women suffering or other human beings suffering. Collectively, we can change the trajectory of their lives. Mm -hmm. My, my mother used to say, here on earth, we are climbing an invisible ladder. And this invisible ladder has its own laws. As we climb, they are rungs. You know, the ladder comes with rungs. So there are other women who are at the bottom of the rung, and there are others who are at the very top of that ladder. Those who are at the top of the ladder, they have a moral obligation to pull up their sisters or anyone who is down. Because that way, we can all enjoy our life. I truly believe in that. I'm not saying we should all be Mother Teresa's, no. But I'm saying with the little that we have, we can change someone else's life. Thank you for sharing. Yes, that's, that's so true. Um, your foundation, um, maybe you can also tell us a little bit about the work of your foundation. Um, so what, what you are doing there and also how people listening to the podcast can support the foundation and what are maybe... Um, yeah, the ways how, how we can give, give back to you and support your, your life's work. So, so I hope there will be links to the, to the foundation. Of course. And, um, the thing when I talk about the passing on of this ugly baton, 
my foundation, we educate both girls and boys, but I always have a special eye on the girl child because even as I sit here, many of our girls are still being denied the right to education. Mm -hmm. They get married early because of poverty. Their mothers are not educated. So the value of educating the girl child is still not there. So I am saying we need not only to get these kids out of primary school and secondary school, but to make sure that they can also go to higher education, do their undergraduate, or do something about their, their life. Mm -hmm. And so my foundation, we have decided that we are going to make sure that every year we send kids to universities. So this year, so we, last year we had our third cohort. This year we are now featuring or campaigning for our fourth cohort. Last mm -hmm. year we did send 11 students, 60% were girls. This year we are trying to send 22 students mm -hmm. and 70% will be girls. And each student requires $10,000 for a three-year program. For their three-year program, $10,000. We are not talking of huge monies. $10,000 US dollars. And so our campaign is to raise around $220,000 so we can ensure tuitions for these kids. Wow. The $10,000 covers their school fees, tuitions. It also covers their accommodation. Amazing, amazing. So is there a link to, to this campaign that I can put in, in the podcast? Okay, yeah. awesome. Okay, so people can can donate to, to this campaign and this yeah. will be for 22 people, for 20, like yeah. children to go to university for three yeah. years. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, I, will, yeah. I, I will definitely yeah. put, put this in the show notes. Cool, Absolutely. amazing. That's, that is beautiful. Great. And um, one more question. What, what I found so inspiring listening to you is your mindset. I mean, just the way you see the world and also where you talked about that whenever there was a difficult situation, you somehow switched it into gratitude and to seeing that you still have it better than, than someone else. And there's something to be grateful for in, in what you have. So maybe you can talk a little bit more about how did you develop this mindset of, of abundance and gratitude and, and acknowledgement of what is there and not focusing on what is lacking, but on, on what is there? Because I think this is, I think the, the secret key also to the life you have today, that, that this is where you always focused your energy on. So maybe you can just tell us a little bit more about how you developed I this. And I think I was very fortunate, like many African women and men, especially those who grew up in rural areas, because in the evening, we would sit by the open fire, surrounded by these women, older women, who would share stories that had been passed from one generation to the next generation. At the core of those stories, there was always the teaching about gratitude. Mm -hmm. Be grateful with what you have because someone else might not have what you have. There is a gift sometimes in the adversity. How do you turn that adversity into that gift that you want to see. Sometimes I think that if I had not gone through what I went through in my life, I don't think I would be sitting here and having this conversation. Mm -hmm. Adversity is a way 
that it gifts us. And I truly believe that. My grandmother would always say there are two kinds of hungers in our life. And it speaks to being grateful. There is the little hunger. The little hunger is all about, I want it now. It's about immediate gratification. I have to have it. It's about comparing yourself with others. Never be satisfied with who you are. But the great hunger, which is the greatest of all hungers in our life, is the hunger to seek meaning in our life. Mm. So even the little thing that somebody gives me, it is the meaning behind that giving. So I have to appreciate whatever people have done because to be grateful, it is to, it is to recognize the foundation of who we are. In Africa, we talk about Ubuntu. I am because we are. Since we are, therefore I am. That's the essence of our humanity. To be grateful that I cannot coexist on my own. I exist because of others. We even have a greeting when strangers meet one another, the first one would say, Sawona, which means I see you. The other person who said, would, would respond, Ngikona, which means I am I here to be seen. I am here to be seen with my vulnerability. I am here to be seen with my gifts. I am here to be seen with my pain and with my joy. We are connected. And even the Native Americans and all the indigenous uh, populations in this world, they teach us something. Humankind has not woven the web of life. We are but one thread within it. Whatever we do to the web, we do it to ourselves. All things are bound together. All things are connected. Our very survival is connected to the survival of others. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. What are your children doing today? So are they, um, are they pursuing your way as well? Or um, did they like go different paths? Some are going different paths. I have um, a girl that I, um, uh, when she came, she was hardly nine years old. And I was afraid if she doesn't come at that time, she might end up, you know, being married off like I, I was. And so she graduated with uh, an engineering degree. Wow. And I have another one, another one she did bio, biomedical sciences. Wow. So she's, she's heading to um, medical school. Uh, and I have uh, uh, my last born, she got affected by COVID and mm. she was, uh, yeah, she, yeah, she was doing an undergraduate. So she's now picking up all the pieces. So, yeah, so as a mom, wow. I'm always saying, hey, do the best that you can. Yeah, it's tough, but um, it's what it is because I, I came to this country with an obligation never to pass on that baton. And I always tell my kids, now it's your turn. Don't let, don't drop this new baton that we have. Wow. Yeah. So beautiful. Um, I have one very last question that I ask all of my podcast guests. So imagine one day you live 
a really long, amazing, beautiful life. You will change so many other lives in this world. And one day there will be the last day of your life. And I would come to you and I would say that there has been a technical problem and everything got deleted. Your books got deleted. All your interviews got deleted. Everything is gone. But I would give you a white sheet of paper and a pen. And you could write on this white sheet of paper three wisdoms that you would wish that the entire world would live by. What, what would you write down? Wow. I am because we are. Hmm. Since we are, therefore I am. That's one hmm. wisdom. And I think that embraces everything. And the second one is my mantra, Tinogona. It is achievable. It is achievable. And the third one is healing. Mm. Because we came into this world carrying soul wounds, many of us. We carry trauma, many of us but they are the wisdom whisperers, the women who can come together and be the healers of those who are carrying trauma. So healing, yeah. Mm. Wow. Thank you. Thierry Rai, thank you so much. Um, I. I I, yeah, I'm missing words because it's just, um, I'm so in awe of you and, and it's just, um, you're such a mind blowing, amazing angel on this planet. I, I really am, am very, 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 very deeply impressed by you and your spirit and everything you, 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 you taught us today. So just thank you. I think this is uh, the best oh. way I, I can say <laughs> just thank oh, you very thank very you. much oh, thank you thank you and thank um you. yeah for everyone listening check the links go to the foundation support um read the books and everything will, will be in in the show notes so thank you so much thank you thank you thank you thank you you're welcome and thank you for having me thank, thank you, you. Wahrscheinlich geht es dir jetzt gerade so wie mir nach diesem Interview, dass du einfach nur denkst, wow, <lacht> wow und äh, dass, dass dich dieses Gespräch hoffentlich tief bewegt hat und dich so sehr darin inspiriert und daran erinnert, dass du deine Träume erreichen kannst, auch wenn sie gerade unmöglich erscheinen. Vielleicht dauert es ein bisschen länger, aber es ist möglich. Und ich freue mich riesig, wenn du auf Instagram at lauramalinaseiler mir deine Gedanken zu der Folge heute da lässt. Folg mir gerne, schreib mir in die Kommentare, was hat die Folge bei dir bewirkt, was nimmst du für dich mit, was ist dein Happy, Holy and Confident äh, Nugget, den du hier aus der Folge für dich mitnimmst. Und ja, ich freue mich einfach, wenn wir da in den Austausch gehen. Geh unbedingt auch auf den Link hier in den Show Notes von der Foundation von Terei Trend und lass uns sie dabei unterstützen, den jungen Frauen die Möglichkeit zu geben, zu studieren und ähm, ja, da einfach mit einem kleinen Beitrag wirklich eine große Veränderung bewirken zu können. Danke für dein Engagement, danke für dein Sein, danke für deine Liebe, danke einfach, dass du Teil von der Happy, Holy and Confident Community bist und ich schicke dir jetzt eine riesengroße Umarmung. Schön, dass es dich gibt. Ganz viel Liebe zu dir, deine Laura.